So it's maintenance time here on Ball Trixie, and um, it's time to change the oil. Quite a simple task, far more than if you have a car, because there's no lifting the car up, taking under trays off, sump plugs, hot oil spilling on your arm. No, you just pump it out into a super tall container, aka an old oil bottle, take it off to your recycling centre to dispose of it, and you're good to go, really. Um, so last time I did this, I went to Peachments, who are the kind of main dealer in Norfolk for uh, Nani, and I bought all of the the kit, the service kit from them, which cost quite a lot of money. And then I found a website which I think is called something like marineservicekits.co.uk, or if you Google it, you'll probably find it. Uh, more than half the price in savings. And instead of a Nani branded oil filter, as you can see, I've got a man filter. I've checked, it's the same one. It's more than half the price, so um, far better. I'm not gonna change this. This is the uh, filter for the fuel. It's more of a water separator slash filter. The, uh, the other part of the fuel filtering is done down there, but that was all done about three months ago. So I know that's all good. Today is just simply um, an oil change because the engine hours warrant one. Um, I, I do one uh, either by engine hours or once a year, whichever builds up first. Um, so this is also a good time to say that I'm not a qualified mechanic. Um, so you can take this video with a pinch of salt, but then I've seen and experienced quite recently um, some qualified mechanics of several decades of experience getting things wrong and doing things and, and basically dissing their fellow professionals of why they have had this done, like this, for example. So just like with varnish, you can ask a question on what varnish, how to prepare, how to varnish. You will get multiple answers. You will get multiple answers on how to change oil. But the main thing to do is do it. Do it regularly. I In my cars, I have my oil changed every 6,000 miles, regardless of if it's fully synthetic and tells me I can get away with 12 or 14,000 mile intervals. It's every six, come what may, because that is the lifeblood of any engine. Make sure it's the right oil. In this case, this is a really basic industrial diesel engine. It's not common rail, um, and it just takes... Where is it? Where have I put where have I put the bloody stuff? There we are. This is what I you just get the cheapest oil you can. Mineral, nothing fancy. Most marine engines of this sort, 9043 horse, 15 W40. Um and this manol oil was the cheapest, and that's why I bought it on Amazon. Last time I changed the oil, this wasn't the cheapest. And in fact, what was the cheapest I got from Wilco, not, not the store you know, but W-I-L-C-O Motor Factors, which is a small motor factor business, mainly in the Norfolk area. Um, so, but yes, it doesn't need to be fancy. It's only going to be in there a short time and these are not fancy engines. Um, but it is important that you don't, here we go, starting off the debates already. Some say you can use semi-synthetic oil if you can't get none. Um, some say you can use fully synthetic. What's the difference? The thing is, um, fully synthetic oils have a lot more detergent properties about them. And what they might start to do is degrade the seals um, and cause leaks through that because they're basically cleaning all the crud out that's accumulated over many years. Um, so... Nani recommend normal mineral. Some say peachments, for example. They said you can get away with semi-synthetic, uh, which is a blend of synthetic and mineral oils. This isn't. This is just truck special, they call this. And it's pretty simple stuff. It's just mineral oil. But the, the main thing to get right is the SAE number um, because you don't want to have too thin an oil or too thick an oil. So I hope that sort of covered those bases. What we're going to do is we're going to turn the tap on. We're going to then attach our hose. We're going to pump the oil out of the sump of the engine through this manual hand pump into our bottle. And then when we've done that, 
we're going to spin off the filter. They should only ever be hand tight and you should always lubricate the rubber seal with some fresh oil, not the used oil, just some fresh oil. Um, in this application, we're not able to pre-fill the filter at all because of the orientation of it. Um, but what I will do is I'm going to give it a couple of turnovers just to before it kicks, just to get some oil and the oil pump going before it kicks over and starts the engine. I also like to do that when I first come down to the boat, when I've left it for a good while. Um, I don't use the glow plugs. I spin the engine over on the starter motor until the oil light goes out, just to raise that oil up before I kick the engine into life. If it is too hard to get off, I've got a couple of these to get the uh, oil filter off. It's also a good time to go over the engine and have a good look round it. I'm going to be checking the um, raw water impeller, uh, check the belts again. You know, I like to keep things a little bit too looked after. So um, my drive belt for the alternator and the water pump, um, I also change that annually as well. I make sure that the coolant strength is correct. Again, on this simple glyco, it doesn't need to be the fancy stuff, 50-50 mix, but I use that all year round and I always top it up with the correct strength um, because it aids corrosion protection, not just freezing protection. Check your hoses. Obviously, this is a really tight, confined space. So vibrations can happen, hoses, the little tie wraps can start to get brittle with the heat cycles and, you know, things can fall off. So check that. You might want to buy one of these little absorbent pads to put under your engine. Um, I haven't got any with me, but they're at home because I'm sensible like that. And the new ones I've got are grey to match the bilge colour instead of white. Um, but other than that, really, when you're just changing the oil... Um, that's really all you've got to, to worry about. And I think I pointed earlier to this here, it's actually there is the raw water impeller. That's the pump um, for the engine water. Not, this is another thing that people, I'll just cover this. So obviously on a car, you have a radiator and the radiator is filled with coolant. You have an electric cooling fan and you have a water pump. Um, obviously on a boat, you don't have a radiator but you have the heat exchanger here, which is filled with coolant, and that is a sealed system. And then you have an actual circular heat exchanger uh, with loads of little copper tubes going through it. And that is what has the water from the river pumped through. And on its way through that, um, it exchanges the heat. So the, the river water that comes in cooler absorbs the heat from the, the coolant, it goes around the system and off out, it, it gets ejected. Um, so the river water, never should it make any contact with the coolant or the other way around. The pump that does that raw water circuit, pumping the river water in and out, in and out all the time, is down there, it's a little rubber thing. And that pipe there that goes off is the pipe that's got all the river water in, hence why it's a clear pipe um, and you can see it and that heads off down there in and out of the, the strainer as you can see there so um, yes I thought I'd just clarify that um, but obviously to pump the coolant around the engine that is you know through all the galleries and everything else there is a separate water pump which is that one there I upgraded my alternator the engine originally had a 55 it's now got a 75 amp alternator that was a real pig to do because of the weird bracketry. And wouldn't you know it, Peachments or Nani no longer make or provide the original alternator assembly for this engine. So a uh, bit of jerry-rigging, but we got there in the end. So I hope that's covered the basics. Um, is there anything else I need to draw your attention to? Mm, warm the engine up before you do this as well, don't just do it cold. Um, you might want to um, do an engine flush, um, either with a flushing oil or with an additive. Um, the additive you just pour in. Um, if I'm using an additive, I like to take a little bit of oil out so I'm not overfilling the oil. Um, run it for about 15, 20 minutes and then 
remove and the additive in the flushing uh, will take any crud, sludge, slime um, or you can get a specialist flushing oil. So you take all the oil out, you put the flushing oil in, you run the engine for like 15, 20 minutes, you take the flushing oil out, then you put your engine oil in. And the flushing oil is basically a, a very thin um, oil packed with additives again to remove any contamination. Um, anything else? Right now, I don't think so. Let's get on with actually changing the oil. Well, this is uh, not easy to do one-handed holding a phone recording, but anyway. Uh, so I've taken the nut off there and I've now put my tubing on, which I can then put into the bottle like so. And um, I've got some kitchen towel down just around the area just to avoid the inevitable. Um, and now it's a case of pumping it up and down. So you can see there's a little stirrup pump there. So I'm just going to make sure that's in there so it doesn't pop out. And you just do that until it fills up the bottle and then there'll be a bit in the next one. So just thought I'd show you that process as well. So we've emptied our oil and um, despite the best efforts you'll always have some spillage, a little few drops or whatever. Fortunately I seem to have escaped with one soaking through to the carpet, which isn't too bad. I put all my oily rags in a little bag as well. Fitted the new oil filter. Fitted the bung. So now it's time to put the new oil in. Two things I didn't say initially was to help the draining process, take the oil cap off where you fill it so that fresh air goes in to help this pump out. Secondly, when you remove the oil filter, make sure that the rubber seal comes off from the old filter and that is not left behind and the face is clean for when you screw this one back in. So now I've just started the engine up. I'm gonna take a clean bit of uh, loo roll, which is really handy because it's bright white. Great for checking the engine oil on the dipstick when it's fresh. And I'm gonna avoid the crank I'm just going to make sure that there's no oil leaking out of the oil filter. And as you can see, there isn't. So we've done a good job. Now I'm going to turn the engine off and recheck the oil. So we're almost put back together. So doing a simple oil and filter change on a boat is a relatively easy task. Take your time. Expect there's going to be mess so plan as best as you can have plenty of kitchen paper on hand um, wear gloves if you want I do because I just prefer not to get all my hands messy and um, little tips I would say is the little food bags are ideal to um, not only put your oily rags in but put the full oil filter in um, so that it's not going to spill everywhere as you pick it up and transport it out. Um, find out how much oil your engine takes, what sort of oil it takes, and then find whatever's suitable for you. If you want to go really mainstream, high brand, great. Um, for me, I just bother to have the right specification. Now, the viscosity of oil is not about necessarily the specification of oil. Um, but as I say, these are pretty um, simple diesel engines. Um, but the, the specification of oil matters more in, in newer engines, newer marine engines, car engines, newer car engines, stuff like this. Uh, because the specification is kind of changing. That's an agreed standard within the industry. And the older something gets, the older an engine gets. Um, the more careful you've got to be with that specification as new oils come out. It might not quite match. Make sure your oil filter is the right oil filter and make sure that once you've changed the oil, you check for any leaks thoroughly afterwards because the worst thing you want to do is turn the engine on and think, ah, that's, oh, whoa, where's all this oil flooding out from? Um, 
And I've given the engine a simple little bit of a degrease, just with some degreasing kitchen cleaner, nothing fancy. Um, obviously, the, the environment that marine engines are in, they're very confined spaces. There's lots of rubber belts spinning around. There's lots of heat. Um, and, you know, it will... They've got a breather pipe on the engine. Obviously, there's going to be a film of oil. But if you keep on top of it, you can keep things pretty clean and tidy. When you're filling up the oil, use a funnel. Avoid spills. If you spill, immediately mop it up. Because the worst thing is, is that in fresh engine oil, run down the engine. Then you're going to go for a cruise. The engine's going to get really hot. You're going to be like, can I smell burning? What's, what's that oily smell? And then that oil will just attract dust and dirt and muck. Um, finally, make a note of when you change the oil, the date and the engine hours. And try and roughly stick to that same period of time when you come to change the oil next. Whether that's you doing it yourself to save some money and have a bit of a sense of achievement. Or if you're going to be taking it somewhere, at least they will also know when it was last done, what was done and have a basis to go on. Use this opportunity to check your engine a bit more thoroughly than you would, although every time I go out on the boat, I always give it a little check, check the oil, check the coolant, check the belts, check the weed filter. Um, just, you know, what's changed? Is there anything, is there any leaks? Where's the oil come from? What's that, where's this come from? Oh, there's a bit more water in the build. Why is that, you know? Don't just think because it's underneath the, the covers, we can ignore it. Um, a simple thing spotted early can avoid a big thing spotted late that's going to cost a fortune. So there you go. Um, I hope that you've perhaps learned something from this. There are tons of more educational videos going through far more in depth than this one has been. If you want to give this a go yourself, if you're not comfortable or you're worried, don't try it. Don't come back to me saying, well, I followed your video and I got it wrong and this is what happened. Um, take to a boatyard. Pay the boatyard and you'll be happy. Um, there's a number of um, really good boatyards on the broads. There's also a couple of really good sort of mobile mechanics now um, who, you know, will come to your boat, depending on the marina and what their policies are, um, and, and do simple things like this for you while you're away um, without having to move the boat so um is there anything else i want to just cover while we're just talking a bit about maintenance um hmm. fuel um i always keep my fuel tanks topped off um this is especially important in the uh, the winter months because um the fuel being heavy and thick oil um, which is what basically diesel is um, will always be a little bit warmer than say the water around it, condensation, the bare metal. So the more bare metal you've got in your fuel tank, the more risk there is that condensation will form because of the mass of the slightly warmer fuel. And it will run down and it's that layer, the interference between the water that's dripping down, the fuel in the air, where you get diesel bug grow. So if you have a fuller tank, there's less space for condensation to form, but also use a, a fuel biocide. And what you basically do is you treat your tank initially with a shock dose. And then every time you fill up with diesel, uh, you follow the instructions on the side of the bottle. And it will say, for example, you filled up with 20 litres, add 3 mil of fuel additive. And it will stop any diesel bug, which if you get can cause blocked filters in extreme cases and all sorts of problems crud in the bottom of the tank. Be very careful when you're filling up. I know that we do it on the broads, not ourselves, it's a boatyard that does, but keep the area around the fuel filler cap clean just to avoid the possibility of, you know, muck, debris, mud, crap, leaves, accidentally getting into the, the fuel tank through the most obvious means which is through the hole in the deck um so that's a bit of a note on fuel um what else is there batteries that's another thing that's often forgotten about on boats you know you just take them for granted um i'm obviously connected to the shore power at the moment and um that's 
put the battery charger on, which if you heard that whirring fan, that's what that is. Um, but yes, try and keep your batteries in good condition. Don't discharge them too much. I never like to take my batteries down more than 50%. And usually um, in a 24 hour period with, you know, the television, lights, the fridge, I only really take about 70% down. So, you know, if there was 100 in there to begin with, it will come down to about 70%. And I'll use between about 45 and 55 to 60 amp hours. So having a monitor that shows you how many amp hours you've taken out, how many amp hours you've got to put back in again, um, what your state of charge is, how many volts you've got in the batteries, etc. is always a good idea. Um, and just give them a check every now and again. You don't have to worry about it as often as your, your engine, but, you know, check, you know, is there any funny smells? Is there any battery acid leaking out of them? Um, what are the terminals like? Keep those sort of oiled so that, you know, you're, you're reducing the risk of corrosion on those. You don't want them vibrating loose. So just give your battery terminals and the wires connect to them. A quick go over. And I personally just change the batteries every four years. I, I regard the batteries as a kind of a disposable part. Um, the batteries I've got on the boat now are... Hancock, I think, tire manufacturer, um, and, and they were £65 each, bought in a pack of four, so I changed the cranking battery and my three domestic batteries in one go, and then either recycle the batteries, or as in this case, I gave them away to another boater, because they were all right, um, but that's what I do, because I'm a bit of an OCD with batteries and and stuff I do like to know that they're in good condition and I'm not going to be out motivated on abroad and suddenly things start oh dear why is the fridge not starting kicking in um etc etc so there you go there's my little talk about little obvious maintenance things common sense things on a boat but things that can just be missed after all most people that come down to the boat is for a break it's for a holiday it's not to go through engineering um but uh I like to keep cars in tip-top condition and keeping the boat in tip-top condition as well. Gives you peace of mind. I also got a recovery service, but the recovery people like to know that you've also been looking after your boat. Um, in fact, it's part of the terms and conditions that you have to uh, either have records of maintenance or invoices that you can show that you've been maintaining your boat to an adequate standard. Um, so, yeah. I think that's about it, really. But... Uh, that's good for another year and then next year will be a bit of a more major service where coolant is changed, the oil and filter is changed, checking the um, air filter, fuel filters, belts, impeller change, um, just a much more thorough inspection, probably take the heat exchanger, give that a clean out as well. Um, just to make sure that things are, you know, spotted. I mean, during one of these, I noticed that I had a coolant leak from the cap. Not this cap, this engine's got two of them actually, peculiar. Um, and what it was, I thought it was just the cap, it wasn't. It was actually the collar that is epoxied in at the factory. And um, Toby at um, Marine Transmissions effected a repair. Uh, which has held and is good because otherwise it would need a whole new heat exchanger old engine heat exchanger it's the only bit the nani marina is obviously really very expensive um more than sort of 1700 pounds expensive so um i'm pleased that he was able to effect a repair but it also meant that i was able to see straight away because the engine's nice and clean and tidy and i checked the coolant i'm losing coolant where's it going where's it coming from so just small things like that really I'm going on a bit much, aren't I? So, uh, there you are. That was changing the oil on this Nani engine. And no, I can't remember exactly what one it is. But it's the 1990s 43 horsepower. It's like the H90 something. High. I think it's an HE. Which I think stands for something like, it's not high compression, but... 
something. It's an old diesel engine out of some Kubota digger, basically, put in a boat. Um, that's all you really got to know.